Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of your Bish Therapist podcast. I am your host, Melissa Reich, your Bish Therapist, a real-life therapist turned pop culture aficionado serving clinical interpretations and hot takes on all things pop culture. And today's episode, oh my word, I am so excited <laughs> to have the beautiful oh. she's an actor she's mm. a comedian she's what? a radio personality yeah. she co-authored a cookbook <laughs> she has her show cabaret me she has her podcast drama darling the mm. queen of the drama <gasps> darlings herself wow. miss amy phillips wow melissa reich your bitch therapist <laughs> looking look at you i'm on your show and you are running it, you're, you know, you're recording it, you're producing it, you're doing it all. And it is Women's History Month. And I just have to say, uh, you know, habada, as my daughter says, to you <laughs> and to us as ladies, look at, look at this. How great. How great. How great. Thank you for having me on. Are you kidding? Thank you for coming on. And, you know, <laughs> what is, what is so wild about this is you and I are just like, loving on each other is most people don't which is wild to me a mm -hmm. lot of my listeners do yeah. not know that mm -hmm. i got my start with you <gasps> and your bitch therapist was born via amy phillips yes. and so you know for so i thought it would be good for us to tell the story a little bit yes about the how origin all... story yes. of ybt yes that's right because i think people assume there are people that assume i've been doing this for decades which like thank you that's so sweet that's mm -hmm. really kind but no i am a newbie at this this is this podcast is less than one year old mm -hmm. less mm -hmm. than you know i started yeah. in august of 2023 and so, you know, f so for everyone listening, you, the, I definitely have drama darlings, of course, <laughs> who <laughs> listen. And I mean, they were my best and biggest supporters, truly. They yeah. DM me. They're wonderful. I mm -hmm. just, I really always want to thank you and I want to thank them because without you and them, I truly would not be here. And I know you're so self-deprecating. You're like, no, Melissa, you did this, blah, 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 blah. But you gave me the opportunity. You gave me a platform. You took a chance on me. And you, most people don't know that you truly are my mentor. You're, you really, you really are. Oh, and I just really appreciate cool. you. That mm -hmm. is so, that's amazing. Um, uh, I've never had that word, you know, described. I've never been anyone's mm -hmm. mentor before. So that's really very special. And um, yes, I told you a long time ago that you should do your own podcast. And when I had you on my show as when I, you know, it turned into drama, darling. Right. I was like, this is such a perfect, you know, time to have you on because we have these off, off the radar conversations. And right. um when I was on Sirius XM, we would DM with each other and you would introduce yourself as your bish therapist. So I thought that was really funny um, <laughs> because I refer to myself as your bitch wife on Sirius XM. That's so right. Th so then she was like, oh, your bitch therapist here, just chiming in on this latest episode of Atlanta or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And a lot of your takes in our messaging were just super fascinating. And I just really enjoyed always getting your feedback. And it was just like here and there and whatever you were inspired to uh, get in touch about. So we had a great rapport yeah. uh, just with a little bit of chit chat. And then, you know, again, like I mentioned, once I moved over to my own podcast, um, I was like, well, I'm going to have her on. And you just like took off. I mean, you it's like you already yeah. had full grown wings. You know, that's what's wild about it is that you're just such a natural about this stuff mm -hmm. that that's why it is, uh, doesn't surprise me at all why that people probably think you've been doing this for a really long time because you are such a natural at explaining, articulating, um, really uh, having a conversational vibe about you when you're talking about reality television and mm -hmm. the clinical interpretations of it. Mm -hmm. So that was just, you were such a smash hit. And everybody loved you. And they're like, more bish therapists, more bish therapists. <laughs> so you're on uh, Drama Darling a few times. And then you started your own Instagram account as your bish therapist. 
Right. I started that in like July. So, so again, for those who aren't aware, Amy was on Sirius XM with Reality Check for like seven years. And so as that, as she transitioned into this amazing new space that you're in, which I'm so excited for us to talk about that too, because you're doing some really amazing things, um, is that it just, it became, yeah, like this natural conversational, um, kind of relationship but i love that like most people have no idea they're like your bish therapist they're like that's such a funny name but they <laughs> don't understand like where it comes from right. and it comes from like it, well you just said right and like my dark humor and i just love to joke about things i'm like well you might as well call me your bitch therapist and so <laughs> you know that so my and yeah it stems my, from joe uh judice who famously right. called Teresa, his bitch wife. And uh, that's yes. why I referred to myself as your bitch wife. And then I would play the Joe clip. Oh, here she comes, my bitch wife. She's such She's... a, see you next Tuesday. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh -huh. that's where it all stems from. So like, like Melissa said, out of darkness comes light. And here mm -hmm. we are, which, you know, again, you on my show talking about so many different aspects about uh, the shows that we watch um, people really loved hearing this take that you have, which is so unique and so original because no one else is doing it. There's no one else out there in this field that is doing um, a clinical interpretation of these reality shows as a podcast or as an Instagram account. And it is just, it's groundbreaking and it's so brilliant and it's what people want and need and they don't even know they want and need it. So it was one of those things where I was just like, it just makes so much sense, Melissa. You just, you, you really just should do your own podcast because you had been on my show a few times. And I just thought right. you have so much to say and so much to give that I was like, don't wait for me anymore. Right. Like this is, you can, you have to, you know, it's wild because as somebody who has witnessed you like explode with like, you can't help yourself. Like, that's what's so interesting about it is that it's so real and so organic um, that you could even be having the worst day and it's still going to be pouring out of you in some way because it's just in there. And it's like, it's your gift. So it very much, when I say it comes easy to you, I mean, um, I I mean, the, the hosting aspect of it really comes easy to you. And certainly... Uh, the work that you do is not easy. I know how much work and preparation you put into all this too. Right. So um, that goes, I don't think people even know like how much work you do. You have pages and pages of stuff when you do these shows. Yeah, yeah literally. I mean, and I, I appreciate that because I I joke with, with you and with people, I literally write papers before most of these podcasts. So whether it's my own or if I'm going on somebody's, um, yesterday I was just on Besties uh, by with Caitlin. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. Now I'm fumbling the name. But um, Caitlin Marshall has a wonderful account and we were talking about attachment theory. And so I had to like, you know, I am such a psychology nerd that I truly love all this stuff so much. And so I'm grateful to hear that it does feel organic because this is just like me nerding out and the love of like the clinical interpretations and, mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. Um, but, you know, and listen, it can be a blessing and a curse. Sometimes people feel like I'm lecturing to them and like I have done teaching my whole life, you know, so as a therapist, mm -hmm. I have to lead, be responsible for leading individual sessions, marriage sessions, couple sessions, group sessions. And fortunately, a lot of that translates to this space, right? Because mm -hmm. I have to know how to host and I have to know how to um, read cues and, you know, all these things. So as Amy knows, the technology of this all, this, what you're seeing now comes easy to me. This does. Um, and when I went on Caitlin's show yesterday, I had, I joked that I had these like dusty boxes somewhere in my brain of like attachment theory that I just had to like, like dust yes. them off real quick and like open the box and look inside it and be like, Oh, I haven't looked in here since I was in graduate school. Oh, that's super interesting. Yeah. Did it all come that, back to you? 
instantly because wow. so fun fact about me is uh in case people can't tell i am type a i am a perfectionist um which yes of course stems from my own trauma and when i graduated from my master's program i literally i was thinking about this the other night i literally had a garbage bag full of um flash cards <gasps> wow because I took it Flash so card. seriously, Flash yeah. But dance. like, yeah. a and that's how I learn best. I do have some, you know, some memory issues after a lot of uh, cancer treatment and things like that. So, mm. uh, a flashcard was like my saving grace, mm -hmm. and um, apparently, it really helped me remember a lot of stuff. Because as oh soon gosh. as I'm like reacquainting myself, right, with like attachment theory by Bowlby, I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I remember some of this and flashcards. <laughs> yeah, I remember you guys. <laughs> Um, but so this part for me is what comes naturally and easily. I'm a naturally very sociable person. I love people. I love talking to people. I'm genuinely interested in it. It's the tech stuff that um, has taken <laughs> some time to adjust to. But you yeah, but you've been, done it. You've well, done it. Because I'm you have to produce your own it. podcast at this point, you know, like we all do. Yeah. We don't, we're not going into a studio. We're not have, we don't have producers. No. So, you know, this is a real grassroots effort here. And um, uh, I'm very yeah. impressed that you, yeah, but you are so type A that it was like, I was like, well, eventually you'll, you'll learn how to edit. But in the meantime, just send me your stuff. Well, my girl, your bitch therapist <laughs> right over here didn't even send me anything. And I was like, how did you, you uploaded a, your first guest podcast. How did you? Like, but I thought you were going to send it to me. And, and I was thinking maybe it was just so tight. She didn't need to edit your, she's like, uh, your girl learned how to edit. I was like, oh my God, you are so type A. Like, it's so crazy. Like you didn't even let me edit anything for you. But, um, it, it, it it's interesting because you really took a leap a into this world and really by surprise to your own self, like you did mm -hmm. not expect to be going down this road at this point in your life and especially with the circumstances in your life. So I applaud you. I know how much you deal with and, um, and it's amazing to me how you can overcome those things and, and deliver this amazing like perspective. And I, and I do have a couple questions for you because, sure. and maybe some of your, uh, Bish listeners have the same thing. Like, when you are researching um, a topic, so say you did Gypsy Rose, um, you have so much to go through in order to prepare. So how much time typically would you say you spend per podcast, excluding this one or one where you have a guest, let's say the heavy hitting ones where you're covering a series, um, and or a specific topic with mm -hmm. regard to like, say, Kim and Croy, you know, how much time would you say that you spend researching and preparing? Honestly, weeks. Um, wow. Which, right. So I... I'll give an example with Gypsy Rose, for example, and like Natalia Grace, which I do still plan to record. I just like, I went on this guest spree, um, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, having yeah, like yeah, a lot of guests idea. on and stuff like that. So I definitely am still going to cover that. But with the Gypsy Rose stuff, when it's a lot of content and my, well, I don't want to say fatal flaw because it's a blessing and a curse, but I will not get on this microphone if I am not certain of what I am talking about. I'm not going to wow. do it because I do not Start. want to harm someone. I don't want to spread misinformation. I think that's easy to do. And listen, of course, I'm not, I, I make mistakes and right, like I'm human and that happens. But the Gypsy Rose one legitimately took me weeks because part of my process and the Murdoch murders, oh my God, that took oh, me sincerely. Yeah. I think that took almost a month. So I have to watch all of it, right? And I have to watch it and then I have to like record my notes. And so my secret sauce with this is just like, it can't be, it's cool because it can't be replicated. It's just like my lizard brain in terms of when I watch something, I look at what I gravitate, like what is my brain clock? You mm -hmm. know, there are little things that my brain will clock and an average person will just completely blow by it, but I, it, it like stays here. Yeah, and then, it sticks out to you. Mm -hmm. Right, and then I'm doing my notes and then I'll observe the behaviors, right? Because for me, the nonverbal um, observation is 
just as important as the words. Mm. So I'm almost watching things twice. Okay. And then <laughs> I'm wow. compiling it all into like word documents, um, intermixed with, you know, I try to grab um, information from research studies and journal articles. And like, it, I don't get my information from like Wikipedia. I get it either from like my own um, like clinical knowledge. And then I just build on that. I'll go to psychology today, or I'll go to like reputable websites just to reacquaint myself. Um, so it really truly is a, a very intense process that the reason I had to take a break the first time, as you know, Amy was like with my health stuff, it was so much work and listen, I loved it and people loved it and it's great. But I realized like without a break, it was just not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so to be honest, some of these guest episodes that I'm doing now, you know, I, um, I had, uh, um, Ryan Bailey, I had, mm -hmm. um, Mandy Slutsker, her episode is coming up. Um, yesterday I did an episode with, um, Lindsay from Vanderpod Recaps. And when I'm doing these hosting, it's less, it's less deep dives and kind of more conversational. So this right. for me is great and it is a little bit easier. And then it's those deep dive ones that sometimes I do dread because it's, it's like sifting through so much information. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm learning, listen, for those who have listened to me since day one, which thank you. I appreciate you all. And I know who you are. Um, I sometimes it was like too much for people. Even it was like, I was packing in so much information that it was like overwhelming. Mm. So this, you know, and listen, I feel mm -hmm. like when you do any new skill or when you do anything, right, all we can do mm -hmm. is learn and grow and evolve. Mm -hmm. And so I'm mm -hmm. learning that not every single thought in my head <laughs> regarding <laughs> the psychology of this stuff like needs to be verbalized. Oh, that's <laughs> interesting. So you've you've um tweaked your technique in a way to which you're pulling back in some areas to keep it more succinct. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Succinct and palatable because I have to remember I'm not giving a lecture. Like there are people who like I have a lot of folks who listen that a lot of professionals. I have psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, people oh, in behavioral health. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah, it's amazing. Um and so there's people and I got a message the other day about someone who uh she goes my therapist told me to listen to your podcast and I was like, "Oh, oh my no god. No way. Are you yeah, serious?" I am <gasps> so serious. I was like, "That is such an honor." Like I I, I'm speechless about it. But the point of it is, is like, I want to give people wow. what they want That's and I want cool. to help teach concepts, but I also want to engage people. And I don't, I, I do, I am aware that I can be intense <laughs> when it comes to this stuff and I have mm -hmm. a passion and I have an intensity around me. And so I, yes, part of season mm -hmm. two has been learning how to mediate and moderate that in a way that's more palatable and succinct for people. So, wow. um, yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Mm, um, thank you. and you used to do a lot of lectures you did. Yes. So one of the parts of my life, um, from the first job that I had out of grad school, my I'm just a natural leader. I'm a good public speaker. Um, that's just, like, I, and I don't like it. Here's the thing: public speaking gives me like bubble guts to know. Oh yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it, I get so nervous, but I'm mm -hmm. I just am good at it. And so my first job out of grad school. Um, they were like, oh, you know, we want you to do outreach to the community and, and go to this meeting of people and, and talk about what it is we do here. I was like, okay, um, how many people should I expect? They're like 200. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> sick, oh God, panic, panic, pure panic. Um, and so essentially I just kind of got thrust into, um, and, and fellow professionals listening to this will feel this on such a deep level when you're mm. new in the field, uh, you just get thrown into stuff that you don't get asked mm -hmm. if you want to do something. They're like, hi, here's your caseload of 4,000 people. You will also be teaching. You will also be doing this. Like at one wow. point I was running a gambling prevention program. I was teaching in Philadelphia public schools. Um, bruh, it, that was wild. Yes. So I was teaching about the dangers of gambling. It was like a program. We had like a grant by the state. This was in Philadelphia mm -hmm. at the time. 
And um, so I had to go into Philadelphia public schools and teach about the dangers of gambling, which was uh, the wildest experience of my life. Those kids hated me. I mean, you know, there are a lot of cultural, uh, elementary, middle and high school. Okay. So I did all of it and every kind of job that I've had. So I worked at Misericordia, which is a local, um, university where I live. And, um, I was put in charge of like, I did some lectures on, you know, mindfulness and progressive muscle relaxation and like how to, um, help some of the students like manage some of their stuff in, Mm -hmm. in their own lives. So I was doing the individual therapy, but I was also teaching and and doing lectures and things like that. So Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, when people do say, you know, sometimes it feels like I'm lecturing, I get that. I do have that part of my personality. Um, and so for me, it's just nothing short of me wanting to share my passion with others, Mm -hmm. but sometimes it, you know, I do want to be mindful of how it can feel very intense. Got it. Well, yeah. I don't, uh, I've never had a problem with your delivery, even if it were to resemble a lecture, because I do feel like it's, it's lecture time. I mean, that's what you're doing. You're telling us <laughs> stuff that we don't know. So well, lecture, it's... lecture me, sister. Thank um, you. Some people I really love, hate that though. I love a lecture. Uh, I have a lecture too. Luscious, I mean, listen. Lectures. Oh, lectures. <laughs> And Amy, can I tell you, by the way, so Amy does, for those of you who who don't know or don't listen, Amy does like hundreds of impressions. And I swear, I think sometimes in Amy's impression voice, there are (laughs) just things that I, and of course I'm like blanking, oh, you know, so we're going to talk about Summer House in a little bit and Carl, you know, Mm -hmm. oh yeah, used to Carl or, oh yeah, (laughs) There are certain <laughs> words in the Bravo verse that I hear your voice and I hear your <laughs> like your um impressions because that they're I've done just my so job. good. I've done they're my job. So I've good, done my Amy. Job. Yeah, you have. They're so That's good. That's sweet. Um I I really think that um you found your niche, obviously. <laughs> I I don't I'm I'm curious would you ever go back to private practice? at this point, because this is a whole new career path that clearly can take up most of your life. So I'm curious (laughs) at this point, would you continue, uh, in the future with going back to being, uh, you know, therapist? It's such a good question. And I swear it's something that I feel tortured by daily because, oh my gosh. Well, and I'll tell you why because I feel um, a lot of pride and personal responsibility when it comes to helping people. That's just who I am as a person. And Mm -hmm. in the area in which I live, there is a lot of terrible therapy. And when, you know, listen, I can now say from a place of self-confidence that I know that I'm good at what I do. Um, I know that people value what I do. And so there's part of me that I wonder if it's a disservice to not do it. But at the same time, for me creatively, this scratches an itch that I didn't know was itchy. Mm-hmm. If that even makes sense. Absolutely makes sense. Yeah. I, I like I grew up and you know, I said this on another podcast I did is that I never like you can't came from like improv and like you've done mm-hmm. a lot of like that sort of creative stuff. Mm-hmm. And I never had the opportunity to do that for various reasons, but mostly being um frozen in trauma. <laughs> being the main one, if I'm being Mm -hmm. honest. Mm -hmm. And so once I, you know, had to leave my private practice and I started doing this, um, which by the way, I had to leave for health issues. Just, there's nothing nefarious there. It's, you know, most people know that about me, but during Mm -hmm. the pandemic, you know, it was like a whole thing. Um, and so what I'm doing now, it allows me to be creative in a way that I just never experienced before. And I'm really Mm -hmm. enjoying being in this space. And to be honest, people want content faster than I can create it if I'm Mm -hmm. being honest. And so I feel that I, you know, I know that my voice is important and whether I'm speaking into a microphone or providing therapy, 
as long as I'm helping people, mm -hmm. that truly is all that matters to me. This effort, what I'm doing now is a little more personally fulfilling because, you know, as a therapist, it's like, it's about being a guide. It's about being a helper. Like it's really not about me or it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And this is like about me and it's, yeah. you know, part fun and, and part creative. And, you know, so I think long answer long is that mm -hmm. I'm probably going to keep doing this unless I feel called to do, go back to being a therapist, which right now, um, this is, this is what I'm very into. So, wow, this is very exciting. I mean, it's like Sheena, you know, she was, <laughs> as she said in the last episode, why can't anything ever be about me? <laughs> And so there you have it. You're just like <laughs> Sheena. Glad. Wow. Just like, I'm just, just like, Sheena. like Sheena. Wow. Oh I didn't know Melissa we had so much in common with Sheena. Who um, knew? Who knew? Well, that is so interesting. I'm not surprised to hear you say that. And I think by way of your podcast uh, reaching people, I think it's uh, directly helping Um in maybe more ways than you ever expected you'd be able to help people. Um, and I hope. yeah, I, hope so. I think it's just so cool because like even the, the Paris and the Paris documentaries, I'm sorry, the Paris podcast that you did, mm -hmm. you did two of them, you know, there's so much in both of those episodes that can be very relatable to a lot of people. And that's mm -hmm. just an isolated example. Um, mm -hmm. there's so much in so many of the things that you break down that people can learn from and start to look inward and, um, and you don't get on here and say, oh, you should all get into therapy. You should all get into therapy. It's not really your point. Um, mm -mm. you're, no. you know, commentating on what's going on in these other people's lives. So, and just as a listener, I always find myself asking myself some questions, mm -hmm. um, inspired by some of the things that you say. Aww. And I think it's very, it's really healthy. And, um, and it also gives redemption to these shows that we watch, you know, and then like, and for you, I guess, because I know we want to talk about Carl and Lindsay, but I do want to ask you, like, why did you even start watching these shows? Because you are a very intellectual person. You're very, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, you're very intelligent. You are a therapist you are highly educated. Um, why would someone like you watch shows like this? It, it's, it's such a good question. People ask me that all the time. And I think that when I was younger, because, you know, a lot of this reality stuff, it's been going on for 15 years, right? At yeah. this point. And I'm, mm -hmm. you know, in April, uh, going to be 43. And so I started watching this stuff when I was like, in my late 20s, never mm -hmm. thinking that, you know, the, the short answer is it, I am fascinated by human behavior, period. Okay. And so the dramatics of, you know, a lot of reality <laughs> TV, just as a person interested me, like, um, I've always been interested in like the people who have egregious behavior, like, why do they do what they do? That is initially what brought me into the space of wanting to know more about psychology. It's not about like, you know, I admire the people who are, who grow and are amazing and, and are self-actualized, but it's the, the reality stuff. It's like the behavior, like the kind of low down icky behavior sometimes <laughs> that just like fascinates me. And it's just the way my brain works. I also am obsessed with like serial killer documentaries and like, you know, the way sometimes that I decompress is to like watch something about a serial killer. I don't know, Amy, my brain should be studied, I guess maybe mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how do you do it where you're not watching and going like, and, and I mean, I was going to say without judgment because, but you probably are judging on some level, right? Well, or no, it, for me, it's not so much a judgment. It's just, it's mostly just uh, critical observations. Okay. So observations from a critical thinking standpoint, from a standpoint of understanding, like, let's say I understand, you know, let's go with attachment theory. So watching some of these relationships on housewives and Vanderpump rules and all these things, it's like, 
oh, like to, to read something in a book and to learn about it versus like seeing how it plays out in actual life. There's so much good information there. And so, so that's part one of it. But then part two of it, to be honest for me is like, I feel like I am kind of aging out of some of these shows and I'm like, well, great. Now I've made this my whole career. So really, truly for me, it's about taking something that once entertained me. It doesn't entertain me anymore. It kind of does feel a little gross or icky sometimes now that Mm -hmm. I'm older. Mm -hmm. But if I can take like, you kind of use this analogy of like, I can take a lot of meat off of a bone like mm-hmm. very little, you know, mm-hmm. like I can, yeah. re- I'm really good at taking something on our beloved shows and saying, okay, this is, let's make this a learning lesson or like a, an opportunity to share, like, for example, about like gr- grooming and things like that. Like there's tough topics that are mm-hmm. covered on top, um, on Bravo and other shows that if I'm feeling like they're not being addressed appropriately, well, that is where my true niche lies. Right. Mm-hmm. Because there's a lot of trauma survivors and people who look to me to be like, well, you, uh, what's your thought on this? Help us like, you know, so I almost have become that voice, which is a lot of responsibility, but I also, I'm just honored and appreciative. Are there any reality stars that you've watched where you've been like completely dumbfounded where you're like, I just have no clue where this person's coming from or what their issue is? Or would you say you pretty much across the board have everyone's number? Yeah, I pretty much across the board have everyone's (laughs) number. And that's just, it's just because in addition to my intellectual conceptualizations, I also have an intuition that you just can't slip anything by. Yeah. Nobody can. It is not Yeah, and that's possible. not a learn. You can't learn that. That's just no. something that you're... This is mm-hmm. part of my special sauce. Like just the intuition. Mm-hmm. Um, now, there are certain people on reality TV that I feel allergic to that like I really like... I'll use an example, just one, um, Jax was always someone that, you know, I actually couldn't watch Vanderpump Rules when he was on it. Cause I just felt so, uh, Wow. <laughs> I had such a wow. strong reaction to him. Uh-huh. And like, it's wild. You know, I don't know him. I've never talked to him. And it, it, sometimes I feel it's a little unfair, but like, I think it's safe to say, like, we kind of know who Jax is and like, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. You, so th- that's just a small example because I'm never going to like my platform, as you know, is not to crap on people or be right. rude or mean spirited. But there are definitely some folks in the space, people that we're watching that are, um, uh, I don't want to say scary, but uh, I definitely have intuition about uh, some concerns, I guess I'll say. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, it's, I just keep it. I keep it right here. Yep. And then when I watch things, I try to, you know, as a therapist, one of the things that primes me for this is you're faced with folks who may have done really terrible things, but I am charged to see their humanity and mm-hmm. to assist them um, rather than judge and label them. Mm-hmm. So while I can clock someone's intention or I can clock someone's underlying pathology, I also can look at it from a space of being non-judgmental and trying to say, well, let's look maybe how this was created, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Wow. Oh, it totally so, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Everything's, everything is created. You're not born a reality star, you know, from your own That's issues. Right. That's what makes a great one. But That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Um, And, you know, here's the thing. Before we move on to Lindsay and Carl, I do want you to share with people um, your, you know, uh, listen, I appreciate you coming on. And as a loving person and my mentor, I love that you're like (laughs) asking me questions and all that. But I do want people to know you're doing something really exciting and new on April 6th. So oh, I was like, I, what am I doing? Yeah, you're like, which one? <laughs> well, you're you're doing you're always doing a lot of stuff, your cabaretes and things like that. But I saw you recently post something about your yes. fun. So can you, yes, yes, can you please talk about that a little bit? So the wonderful gentleman, Ross Caputo, who put together Reality Bites Live with Stuart, Chef Stuart and I, mm-hmm. uh, is it's the same guy who put that on. He 
uh, approached me about doing a Stars at Sea, which is like, you know, you charter a, a super yacht, essentially. I mean, kind of not. It's like a booze cruise kind of thing, but it's very chic. Um, she, 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 honey. She, 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 very she, 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 she. <laughs> and I remember at our Reality Bites live event, I said something to him about like, oh, yeah, you should do, we should do like a below deck thing. I mean, it was just like, and I think he had that idea already. Mm -hmm. So then when I just said it and he was like, oh, yeah, I've thought about that. I'm like, oh, well, you should totally do it. I did not think that in a couple months time, he'd be like, hey, so we're going to do this. I was like, oh, OK. Um, <laughs> You're like, yeah, sure. <laughs> also, I get like really seasick. So, um, oh, but, so I made sure that we're not like we're not leaving the harbor here in L.A. We're just going to. So it's really oh. still and fine. So we're just going to like tour the harbor. It's going to be so beautiful. And um, it's just basically uh, an elevated booze cruise and a comedy show. So I will be hosting Aww. and like people buy tickets and they come on this boat. You get, you know, food and uh, there are going to be drinks. It's going to be a ton of fun. And mm. I'm waiting to see if he's going to have any other, you know, like reality stars join mm -hmm. us. Sure. And uh, yeah, the tickets are for sale now. If you want to get them, the link is in my bio, Meet Amy Phillips. And that's here in L.A. On okay. April 6th. On so, April 6th. And Amy, yeah. can I tell you something super special? So Amy and I, and listen, we may not get to Lindsay and Carl. I have no idea because we're, really <laughs> we're really having a kiki. But so I can't but help feel a little bit of like a spiritual connection in that. So April 6th is my 25-year anniversary. Wow. 25. I know, Whoa. which, ew, I have never felt so, like, I'm grateful to be old, right? Aging, aging is a gift not granted to everybody. And so I, it is a gift to me, but it does feel weird that, like, I am in a survivorship from a first cancer, like, for 25 years, like, old enough to, like, vote and run a car. And it's just, like, it's just a very weird thing. But when wow. I saw that, I was just like, I'm so proud of you. And I'm so proud of, you know, all the things that you're doing. Because truly, you know, there's a lot of personalities in this space, a lot of uh, different uh, levels of humanity in this space. <laughs> and you're just like a real one, Amy. You're just like a real one. You're a good one. You're just like oh, such a wonderful nice. person. So please like, you know, and I hate the fact that, I am so, I literally couldn't be further away from you. And I so know, being on the East I Coast, know. I it's never, a real bummer. it is. I never got to participate um, in any of this, but yeah. um, I'll be with you in spirit. And the, and the other you. thing is Amy and I both, we had um, an owl experience. Do you remember that, Amy? Yes. Oh my God. That's right. And so I swear to you, I just think we're like a little spiritually connected. Yeah, so we have for, to be, we have to be, I mean, there's no other yeah, this wouldn't be happening if we weren't. Yeah. And so the brief story there is, Amy, when you were contemplating leaving Sirius XM and doing your own thing, you told the story about hearing an owl. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you, you, you like took it as a sign and you, yeah. you know, were really taken aback by it. And then the week that you and I were talking about what should I do? Like, I was really hesitant. I was like, should I just try this and podcast? Like, I was terrified about it. I was like, is the market too saturated? Will people like me? Will they like what I have to say? So I'm like thinking obsessively about this. And all of a sudden, I hear an owl. That's insane. And I like, here's the thing. I it's, I remember we did talk about it because this was so long ago. This was like last year. And I'm telling you, I have never heard it again. <gasps> never heard it again. And when, so when you talked about your owl story and then I had mine, and then I see that you're doing this cruise on April 6th, which is, I, I, I don't know. I just, I'm That's one of those people. Really incredible. Yeah. So I mm -hmm. think, you know, you and me, we see each other. Yeah. We Amy. see each other. Who, who, who? Who, who, who? <laughs> da. As your sweet little girl likes to say. Yes, so, she does. 
Okay, so with the last 10 minutes or so, let's get yeah. into a little yeah. bit of Summer House. Yes. Um, and listen, for people who are listening who do want me to get back to some deep dive, stay tuned. I will be doing that. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I posted some stuff on Instagram that got a lot of attention about Carla and Lindsay. So I was just going to read that quickly oh. and get your thoughts on it if that oh my gosh. is okay. okay. Yes. Um, because, so this was, um, the episode where before we got to see last week, it was just where we left off, where Lindsay was saying she had PTSD from cocaine, Carl, blah, blah, mm. blah, which I was like, mm, rage. Well, um, yeah. you know, I'm just like a huge advocate for people, you know, sobriety is hard. Mental health recovery is hard. Like that is some wild stuff. So here's what I said. I said, watching mm -hmm. Lindsay falsely accuse Carl of being cocaine, Carl was horrifying horrifying i watched Lindsay have a literal temper tantrum when her unstable emotional state wasn't coddled side note she was intoxicated and behaving irrationally oof the irony which by the way it's not mm. irony it's classic projection mm -hmm. um so just to be clear like i was being silly here but like um and i'm you know we'll talk about that in just a minute but I watched her weaponize Carl's sobriety and engaging in psychological warfare when he set healthy boundaries in response. Uh, in this moment, I felt full respect for Carl uh, for once. Very rarely mm -hmm. are things 100% one person's fault, but in this moment, Lindsay was 100% wrong. Her behaviors were childish and quite frankly concerning and somehow managed to destroy Carl's trust, safety, and respect in one fell swoop. Society sometimes forgets that men have the right to safety, too. And as a sober man who lost his brother to addiction, he realizes this is a life or death disease. So when it comes to saving your own life getting sober, it is deadly serious when someone weaponizes this against you. Mm. In my opinion, Carl's decision to call off the engagement is not only understood, it's respected and admired. It proves that he is taking his sobriety seriously, removing himself from people, places, and things. Lindsay made herself an unsafe triggering person that night huge respect to Carl for realizing he deserved better mm, amen to that I mean Completely I know that agree. was intense but like I mean I know you cover summer house um mm -hmm. so yeah what has been your take on all well, of this I just never you know I was very naive last season when they were engaged and everyone was coming for them and I felt like they were just relentless trying to break them down. And I really mm -hmm. hated that. I hated mm -hmm. that for them. It was undue pressure and stress on their relationship. And I just thought, let love just be love, you know, sure. maybe it will work. You know, he, she was there for him during a time in which he needed somebody. Um, I was questioning the timeline. I thought this could be very dangerous because he got together with her before his full year of being sober. Right. And he Which, was by like the a, way, a month or never, two short. It's not. So the, there's a reason that there are rules in sobriety. People don't like this, but there is research to support the one year rule, right? Because mm -hmm. it takes such a long time. And listen, a year isn't that long, but in sobriety to focus on yourself, your growth is paramount because unfortunately, a lot of folks with substance abuse issues also have relationship issues, maybe some sex and love addiction, or if it's not an addiction, there's some, there's just codependency. There's things that happen. So there are reasons for that rule. Um, but yes, please continue. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think, you know, people have heard that here and there, but not, maybe we don't understand fully, mm -hmm. but so when she, when they got together, I thought, oh, this could be really, this could be really tricky and not good. Well, she stopped drinking and they seemed to be really on a great path together that they were helping mm -hmm. each other. And they were just being very responsible adults, very healthy adults. They were pulling away from the group because mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the summer house is a party house. And so oh my gosh. I just crazy. I, I just didn't like how people were coming for them and wanting to tear them down when sure. I just thought, give them the opportunity. Maybe this is working because they've been friends for so long and maybe this is going to win. You know, mm -hmm. love is going to win this way. So mm -hmm. I did not appreciate that. Now, uh, cut to a lot of people that disagreed with me. Um, and I get it because they don't they never trusted Lindsay to begin with. And now here we are. I totally see what everybody's saying. Right. Um, 
I think that looking back, Lindsay, you know, took advantage of someone who was very vulnerable yep. um, and to get what she needs. And um, he yes. was in a space where he couldn't think for himself and was desperate for the support, attention, mm -hmm. love to get him through this, not to mention the death of his brother mm -hmm. um, and all the other things. And Lindsay was all that for him, but at the detriment of his own health and sobriety. So now for her to be turning from literally, you know, what is in a way his hero and his angel into like literally the wicked witch mm -hmm. um, and for it to snap so quickly just goes to show that her intentions were not right and his intentions not right. Like they both really made a terrible choice to be together. <laughs> um and and it was very clear, obviously, when she was willing to call him Cocaine Carl. Um, right. I do understand there's PTSD uh, when it, you are dealing with somebody who you've had bad um, experiences with mm -hmm. that have been in, intoxicated, but um, they should have never been together if she's had those before, you know, that she should have never been with him having that baggage as it is. Well, I just think, you know, to kind of sum up what my theory was when I talked yesterday with Caitlin is that I feel um, regarding attachment theory, I don't have time to get into it all, but I know that Lindsay's biological mom um, stopped out on her. And I think mm. that for me, when you're, there's a lot of people who like, when they get mad at Carl or Lindsay, like they want them dead, but I'm like, they're humans, right? And so Lindsay is a human being who wasn't given the love that she needed. And because of that, her attachment style is really concerning. It is. And mm -hmm. so, and, and Carl, I feel the same thing because when you're on substances, you can't have the opportunity to form a fully functional, healthy relationship. You just can't, you're just, you have like a mistress, your substance or whatever. That's your like mistress. Like you can't mm. be present. And I almost believe that Lindsay, um, I, I feel like she tried sobriety and had too much emotional variability. And I think that, you know, there's folks that I'm never going to label them anything, but there's folks that use substances, I believe in the summer house to, um, to kind of dampen their feelings. Mm. And so I feel that, you know, had Lindsay stayed sober, things could have been different for both of them. And listen, it's mm. not, she, she doesn't have to, I don't know her, maybe that's not her path. But all I can say is as an observer, um, it seems like, and this is going to be a little bit controversial for me to say this, but it seems like she kind of liked Sick Carl. Like it, Sick mm. Carl yes. was, yeah. um, you know, Gave her he, control and power. Yeah. Yeah. And when mm -hmm. someone isn't sick anymore and they're healthy and they now can see through your weaponizing behaviors to see like, wait a second, this doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, she doesn't like that because she can't like Lindsay has a hard time having um, healthy relationships because she wants she doesn't want a partnership. She wants to be a dictator. So what is that called? Like, what is that called in the world of clinical psychology when you like it, it, it's almost like a level of Munchausen where you like to keep your hand like you want someone to be ill on some level or need you on some level that gives you all the control so that they're like feeling always indebted to you or, you know, what is yeah. that? Codependency. <laughs> so oh, it's, it's that simple. Okay. It, yeah. Well, so it's, it's, that's the simple answer, but okay. there are different attachment styles that I believe Lindsay, you know, does possess some really, um, difficult attachment styles, but really what you're saying is codependency. And that is why for the first year of recovery, you know, when you're freshly sober, you're at very high risk for codependency, especially in pre-existing relationships. So I talk about codependency like um, someone else becomes your emotional thermostat. 
Mm -hmm. And you try to use certain things to get them back under your wing or to earn favor, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of the long and short of it. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately, you know, I'm being mindful of our time and I know, um, <laughs> this went by really, really quickly. Oh my God. <laughs> That um, was the so, thing. <laughs> I know, I know. And I'm sorry for everyone listening to this. They're like, what? They just started talking about that. Um, so listen, Amy, I just, we, again, we could talk all day. I'd love to have you back on maybe after the yeah. cruise and you can talk all about that or, you know, what you have could you could just but... keep going without me and wrap up your thoughts of Carl and Lindsay. No, that's okay. I, okay. you know, <laughs> your, your bish, your bish is having a tough day. <laughs> Okay. And, um, uh, yeah, I think we're going to, I think we're going to end it here, but so okay. what, I, what I just yeah. want to say is thank you so much for being on, please, everybody go over to at me, Amy Phillips on Instagram tickets oh, for the cruise are in your bio, in your, yes. a link yeah. in bio, as we love to link say, bio, baby. um, please check her out. Her Patreon is called drama darling. It is absolutely hilarious there is interactive things available if you join if you follow all that stuff the drama darlings are chef's kiss thank you Melissa. amazing oh my gosh thank you and for everyone listening thank you for listening please uh, make sure to follow me at your Vish therapist on instagram please uh follow my podcast of course please give me a five-star rating if you would be so kind uh thank you all so much and i'm just going to read my disclaimer uh okay. posts are not intended to die diagnose, treat, or provide medical advice. Your Bish Therapist is for entertainment and informational purposes only. The podcast, my opinions, and posts are my own and not associated with past or present employers, any organizations, Bravo TV, Greyheart Productions, or any other television network. The information in YBT Podcast and on its social media is provided for general information purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat. Please do not act or refrain from acting based on anything you read, see, or hear on YBT Podcast or associated social media. Communicating with YBT via email and or social media does not form a therapeutic alliance. Melissa operator of YBT is unable to provide any therapeutic advice, treatment, or feedback.